Certainly. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I actually find my own career path incredibly weird. The fact that I find myself here today is somewhat amazing to me. I'm obviously from the U.S. originally, and a girl from New Jersey to land in Bahrain was certainly not anything I would have planned, you know, thought I could have planned if I had tried. My this portion of my career um, really started in Philadelphia. I had been after graduate school. I went in to get my MBA um, in at the top of the tech bubble, if anyone remembers the tech bubble, and I came out with my MBA at the bottom after it had burst and found that that was a bad time to be looking for a job with a newly minted MBA. Um, so I decided that I I just kind of opted out of the normal job circuit. I opted, I went to a job fair and was so in, bored that I decided it wasn't for me, so I joined the Peace Corps. Um, moved to Morocco and was there for about a year uh, after 9-11 all of, most of the volunteers in that region were brought back to the United States and so I find, my, find myself in Philadelphia and was very lucky to really begin my career at the Wharton School in Philadelphia in executive education and that was my first experience well in secondary education on that, you know, of that type and then executive education certainly um, and I parlayed that into a role at Columbia Business School, again in executive education, where I really had started with sort of the sell side, program de design development, executive work, and then moved into some more the operation side of it, which gave me very much a well-rounded view of the educational sector, kind of what those large institutions, what made them tick, how they operated. And then one day I got the call from a headhunter and said, you know, how about Qatar? And I said, where? You know, I, <laughs> I looked it up real quick to remind myself from, you know, where, where exactly we were talking about. And the more research I did, the more exciting the opportunity became because North America is a very, you know, mature educational market. There, you know, there's really limited opportunity for creativity, development, and growth in that way. But to look at a market, you know, in the GCC specifically, that really was open for opportunity. There, you know, there really is a great deal more flexibility and opportunity within the infrastructure here that allowed, well, allows for impact, allows for, you know, a much more dynamic work environment. So I, honestly, I jumped at the opportunity. I, you know, we went to Qatar um, for a startup institution. Um, when that assignment was complete, we moved to uh, my, well, my husband and I moved to Hong Kong for another more traditional business school, but got greater experience in the Asian market, uh, which was new in my experience. And then the call of a lifetime came one day, and I got the opportunity to come back to the BIBF, which of course I knew a great deal about having worked in Qatar, um, because really everyone who works in this space in the region knows the BIBF. It really is the institute after, mo after which most of the regional institutions are fashioned and kind of aspire to. And so when I got the opportunity, it really was, n it was not negotiable. We, we love the region, we love the, the GCC, we wanted to come back, and then the BIBF was just an opportunity of a lifetime, really for me professionally. Um, and what I've really enjoyed discovering while I've been doing it is, as I mentioned a moment ago, the breadth of the, the curriculum. You know, you don't get a chance like this anywhere in the world. I mean, the BIBF is really, and I've seen now institutions in Asia, I've seen them in Europe, obviously in North America. It is truly unique for a whole host of reasons, some of which are the nature of the market, the nature of Bahrain being a relatively small market. But some of it, I think, is just kind of the vision the, the vision of the past, the vision for the future, we, it's a mar you know, the BIBF does academic, professional, and vocational, and you never find institutions that are willing to coordinate and collaborate all those three things. So to be able to take my personal experience in higher education, both from a business development, product development, and an operational side, kind of the global experience, and then bring it all back into an institution that really is unique globally in what it does. Um, it has, glo you know, it recognizes the need for international partnerships, so it brings those in. It, you know, has its own homegrown intellectual property in areas of Islamic finance and takafa, which make it stand out. So it is, you know, I'm, we really enjoy it. It's my background, I'm blessed that my background really led me to, for me, the perfect job. Yeah, I re yes, I really am. I mean, I, 
have, you know, my dad was a teacher. You know, it's education has been something that's been very precious to me personally, to my family, of course, and it is one of the few things that you can offer someone that can genuinely and truly change their life. You know, it's something that can never be taken away. And to come into, I'm sorry, that's me, apologies. <laughs> Um, education, yes. yes, and so yeah, I mean education in general is one of the few genuine inputs that will change someone's life, that can really impact them, and unlike, you know, things can be taken away, experience and education cannot, and so I have throughout my career been you know, a very big advocate of education for all, you know, equal opportunity for access to education regardless of what the market I'm in. Um, but I think here, my, the biggest surprise to me here and the most pleasant surprise to me here was the biggest complaint when I arrived in Bahrain was we didn't have enough courses. We offer 300 courses. It's hard to have, to not have enough courses when you have 300 courses. And everyone here is committed to their personal development. I mean, well, generally speaking, but everyone I have encountered is completely committed to their personal development and education, and that is universal. You know, I we've noticed as with the trends globally, there's huge numbers of women in the courses that we take at all levels, um, and that number is continuing to grow. But it really just is part of the cultural ethos of Bahrain that you don't find. I personally have not found anywhere else, certainly not in the GCC and not, certainly not in North America. I think, you know, I have personally always valued my education, but I notice in a place where it's sort of a given, it's taken, it's taken for granted. In a place where it's not always, you know, it, it, it not, I mean, Bahrain has an excellent infrastructure for that, but where it's not always as much a given, people really are hungry for it and if the biggest problem I have in my career is we don't offer enough courses, you know, people are clamoring for more, I'll take that any day. So you have students from all over the region? We do actually. I mean the vast majority of our students are of course Bahraini, um, but we do actually they're actually calculating in the office, even as we speak, the exact number of countries we have served, people from different countries we have served. and. The number is well above, I'll be conservative right now, but the number is well above 35 countries. In any given year, we'll do training for companies in or students from um, 17 to 20. Certainly the entire GCC, um, much of the Middle East in general, and then as far afield, last year's Ireland. Um, especially in areas of Islamic finance where we have truly unique intellectual property that you don't, that with the growth in that market, I mean Islamic finance is the biggest growth sector in the financial services industry and we are blessed to have some of the best and old longest standing curriculum and reputation in that area so we get a lot of requests for that and as honestly markets are kind of waking up to that reality and realizing that this is something they really need to be paying attention to if they want to stay current in the in the field they're calling and saying um can you help <laughs> and we're happy to do that so what what are some of the new programs that well, the programs, like I said, there's a lot of programs. The, some of the new, the newest one, of course, we're very proud of our dealing room, uh, which we just launched, like I said, October of last year, so it's about a year old now. And we're doing a host of, pro we were trying to do a buffet of programs in that space because people hear dealing room and they think trading, which, of course, we are dealing with and we are addressing. But really, a dealing room in any in, in, exists within an ecosystem of a bank or an institution and that really involves you know the compliance areas the risk areas you know there's it really is not just simply about the trading and so we're trying to as with all of our courses make sure it's as part of an integrated whole within the organization so you come in and you understand not just your side of the desk but your risk guy who is you know there's usually frequently a lot of tension within an organization between components especially when you're talking about high risk trades and high volume you know a lot of money is at stake but the best way to make any decision is to make sure that you understand why the guy on the other side of the desk is saying, no, what are the issues? What are the ramifications? What are the implications of that? Uh, we're also trying to build in uh, a takafa mo model there, an Islamic fi um, 
a simulation around dealing and trading Islamic products, which we're very proud that the fact that the dealing room is the first of its kind in the GCC, but that simulation will be the first of its kind in the world. And again, in the fastest growing sector, it's something we're really excited about. Now, we're working on that and it hasn't quite launched. How has the response been? Overall, the response has been excellent. The banks have been very supportive of sponsorship. We've had a lot of um, interest in the training. And in fact, a lot of the training we've had, I was actually surprised. We've just from the quickness of the uptake, we've had students again from around the region as far, you know, North Africa um, and all around the Middle East for the programs. So those have been going um, extremely well. So while that's just kind of one example of the programs, the new programs that we're offering, it's the most exciting. Um, do you have several long term partners? So, uh, who are some of you? Oh, many, 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 many long term partners. Um, one of the things that, like I said, the uniqueness of the BIBF model is the recognition that, well, it's really the recognition of learning as a lifelong activity, as a career, or if you want to strictly talk about financial service, you know, of career long activity. And so we have academic programs, which is a traditional kind of educational model. We have vocational. We talked about before, you know, some of the soft skills, many of the things that uh, the staff need across a broad spectrum of curriculum. And then we have professional. And that combined, and that really is where a lot of our partnerships come into play. Um, when you look at learning in this day and age, when you look at, you know, in the year 2015, the educational models that are employed mostly around the world, they're actually all starting to flounder. They're having very, very serious issues. And one of the reasons for that is commitment to an old model, commitment to the traditional academic model, which while it's excellent in some ways as far as, you know, the, the idea of learning to learn, how do you, you know, teaching people to learn, it is not necessarily inherently linked to mastery of skill, which is what the market wants, especially in an industry like ours, which is very, you know, specific, it's, you know, it's not history, it's, you know, not art, which are very important subjects, but a little more nebulous in the spe specificity of the skill set. And we find that right now there's huge trend in education related to professional certifications because it pr provides both a mastery of skill, a proof of mastery of skill, and an international credibility that is instant. If you have, for example, an ACCA, that's the same in New York, that's the same in London, it's the same in Hong Kong, and it's the same in Bahrain. So it allows for portability of skill, instant credibility. So the workforce, not only is it valuable in the domestic market, but it's portable. You can go anywhere with those sorts of skills. So I think the local market is very wise in its uptake of that kind of thing. Now to your question specifically about partnerships, that's something that the BIBF has been very forward thinking in, in that we have, I mean, I'm good, I'm, again, they're calculating the numbers because we're doing kind of our annual summary of data, but well over 30 international partners, and we really do go looking for kind of best in class in any given category because that's the benchmark that as people are, you know, look so chartered accountants, you know, again, ACCA, AAT, CPA, CFA out of the United States. But if you look at any different category we work in, and we do supply chain, we do IT, we do project management, we do accounting, we do marketing, management, leadership. You, we have made a concerted effort to go out and find what is considered kind of best in class certification and those are the ones, and then in com combination with of course recognition in the market, bringing those in. So our partners really are how you can bring in a level of instant recognition and credibility that would take generations to build organically. In the pipeline, what are your plans for the next year and next few years? Well, I think, again, the dyn it's really a great market to work in. <laughs> Bahrain really is a fun place to work because the BIBF has really become, in many ways, the cornerstone of you know, learning and development within we talk, you know, financial services, of course, but beyond that, you know, in business skills in general. And so to be able to support the regulator in the CBB and make sure that we have, you know, mapping to the rule book and making sure we support that. To work now as we uh, work much more closely, we're looking forward to our opportunities to work with Tim Keen and expand our breath to other industries that are that also need, you know, business skills are not unique to financial services. Uh, working with the EDB to make sure that we have 
we continue to provide the best human capital in the region, which will allow for the con their continued growth in the foreign direct investment and the work that they're doing. So we, are, we do pay very close attention to partners on that level and making sure we act as a cornerstone to the major players, the, the people who are really you know, focused on the future strategy of Bahrain. Um, kind of, of course, on a individual, mi more micro, you know, to the BIBF specifically, again, our partnerships with the recent launch of the London School of Economics, University of London, London School of Economics program so that we have really the well top tier education in that space again you know very much the credit instant credibility that comes with the kind of program of that type um, we've gotten you know ACCA platinum status well platinum status with the ACCA uh, recently which is very difficult to do and you know, again, shows the quality of the edu quality of the programs, um, which helps tremendously. We have great faculty, I should say that. We've been very blessed with a lot of our, you know, our full-time, part-time, and practitioner-driven faculty have been really the cornerstone of the institution. We're also working with partnership in partnership with um, other international players related to getting an international certification in Islamic finance. That, you know, again, we have the content, but really getting working with partners who have global certifications who will then you know take the BIBF material worldwide and specific in Islamic finance so we're working with CISI and others in programs like that I love the f I'm so excited you brought up the research thing because actually that's something that I think back to what I you know I'll make a bad analogy or a difficult it's somewhat strange analogy when you looked at um, technology, phone technology. If you look at a country like the United States where everything was initially built on landline technology because it was the first, uh, you know, first generation of that. And then you jump to, a, you know, Scandinavia where they kind of pioneered cell phone technology because the infrastructure just didn't allow for landlines, quite frankly. You just can't get them across the fjords. It's difficult to do. Bahrain is and has an incredible opportunity right now specific to the research strategy and really the educational strategy in general and I know that um, you know the power you know the, the the individuals who are working on that are open to new ideas as you know I've been in conversation with them about it because as a country that is now developing a, m a more structured and you know an infrastructure around education to have the opportunity to learn what you know what is not working in other places and sort of leapfrog ahead because they're not constrained by the existing infrastructure, so to speak. You know, it's really, really exciting, um, especially in the area of research because right now, if you look at exa existing educational infrastructures, they are burdened by their history. They're burdened by, you know, they're producing endless numbers of specialists in a market that needs increasingly generalists. You know, the, the research infrastructure the tenured faculty infrastructure, these things are now, in my opinion, what is going to be the next big crisis in North America, at least, related to education. Um, whereas in a market like this, where we can really focus on applied research, case writing, market-driven interests in research related, makes it much more useful, much more applied, much more relevant, so you, it's easier to get funding, it's easier to really bring that where it's most of, mm, useful and effective. And as an institution like the BIBF, where we are Ma you know, skill-based, practitioner-based learning, we're actually really excited about that. So we're personally, well, internally to the organization trying to focus on what our contribution to that could be, how that would look within the confines of BIBF as a non-traditional institution, um, and as much as we can help support the HEC and the ministry, you know, as they're talking about what that research strategy is going to look like, because I do think it's very wise of them to be focused on it. It's definitely a need. Um, in the, you know, in the larger market, not just specifically Bahrain, but I do think it's a tremendous opportunity to kind of leapfrog ahead and really say what could, let's not recreate a system, you know, let's not do that, let's take it, the components of it that will work best for us and, you know, move forward that way. Well, I was, like I said, the BIBF has a tremendous reputation in my, in the industry. Um, so they have, you know, they have an incredible legacy and have really put together a remarkable infrastructure. Um, when, so when I came in, like I said, there were already 300 courses running, so there is a, a tremendous amount going on. We've taken the time over the last few years to kind of 
you know, in reinforce the infrastructure, if you will, because we want to continue to see it grow and develop, and we needed to kind of stabilize the foundation to do that. But really, I see the BIBF as, in many ways, continuing that legacy, continuing on what's going, what they have been doing for years, but also in part simplifying to the sense, in the sense that, you know, what are we where we want to develop, we want to support Bahrain through learning. That's what we do. Um, now, we focus and we'll continue to focus on financial services. That is, of course, the core of it. But we want to use the uniqueness of our platform, the uniqueness of the course offerings that we have, and really say, you know what, we can help, as I mentioned before, the regulator, the EDB, Tim Keen, and really help build Bahrain. We are not going to, we are going to use what resources we have to support in any way that we can do that. And so, Again, that is very much unique to Bahrain and the infrastructure of the BIBF that really doesn't exist anywhere else. Most institutions of this type outside of Bahrain focus on their, their national identity. They focus within borders. And for a host of reasons that I think were as opportunistic as they were strategic, because of the nature of this market, the BIBF has always looked beyond that. In order to provide kind of the breadth and depth of material content information that we want to do in this market, you cannot strictly focus on the market because there just aren't, it's, it, there's not enough people in, in any given training. So we, they have always expanded beyond that, which has provided a tremendous strategic opportunity because it does help raise the visibility of Bahrain. It is not strictly the BIBF. It is not about us. It is about what we can do to help raise visibility, help raise awareness of the quality of the human capital, of you know, bringing people in for educational tourism, really making it a place people think of when they want high quality learning, and that's what we do. Um, it's, uh, I, I mean, these are both very American examples, but they were beaten into my head in business school myself. You know, there are two very kind of iconic US brands. There's Kodak, which every, you know, if anyone who is old enough to remember film will remember Kodak, and they, were one of the biggest victims to the disruptive technology of digital you know, digital cameras, largely because of their strategy, what they focused on. They, if you ask them, they would say that their specialty, their strategy was um, chemical imaging, which is problematic when digital imaging comes into place, because they didn't even know that what th what they sold has nothing to do with film. They sold memories. That was their business. They sold people their lives, their memories. That is what they did. And that is, was very telling for me when I learned that. And the other example I use right now is, again, no, it's not particularly relevant in this region, but Walmart. Walmart has a one-sentence strategy. Every day, low price. Halas, that's it. That's what they do. And if you combine those two ideas for Kodak, of course, saying, you know, know what you do. You know, we do classroom learning. That is part of what we do. But what we do is knowledge. You know, we want to help people grow, develop through learning, through knowledge. How we do that, anybody's, you know, up to be, it's yet to be determined. And we will, of course, continue the traditional models. But it's important to me, you, you know, what are we going to be is really making sure we remember the core of what we do. And the second piece of it, linking it to the Walmart example, is making it simple enough that everyone can see themselves in the vision. You know, so on a, you know, well, it's accessible. It's easy to understand. It will drive decision making. It will drive behavior. It will, in a vacuum, make sure, you know, I make sure I don't have to be in the room that the right decision get made. But if you can't see yourself in the vision, if you can't see yourself in the outcome, there's a great deal more ambiguity as to how people behave, what the decisions they make are, where do they know where the ship is pointed? Because if everyone knows where the ship is pointed, you'll all get there. <laughs> and you don't have to be in the room to make sure that everyone does that. So those two concepts are very much guiding how I'm trying to focus the BIBF right now and what we're looking to do. But really, it's about knowledge. It's about learning. And I don't have the pithy one sentence yet. <laughs> we're putting that together. But that is the general direction. Yes and no. I think 
very few educational institutions have kept up with that. The private sector has done a much better job than the traditional educational sector in that area. I think there is a great deal of awareness of it. Now, I think related to technology in general, it will, I think, very much revolutionize education, getting back to the point of it's really about learning. So, I mean, if you look now at things like the big MOOCs that are coming out and the Khan Academy and other, what you could say, disruptive, you know, educational platforms that are coming up, I still think there's a great deal of ambiguity in the market as to how that is going to play out, what that is going to look like, how disruptive that is going to be in a traditional educational model, because while it does, back to your very first question, provide equal opportunity for all for education, it does require an incredible amount of individual learner accountability, which is very nice to talk about and very rare to find. Like, you know, and I put myself in that category, you know, there, the discipline, you know, the number of people that start those MOOCs, you know, they've had, you know, I think MIT did one that was 70,000 applicants, you know, 70,000 enrolled and 700 finished or some ridiculous, and I don't know the exact figures, but that is a reasonable approximation of the, you know, so I think there's a lot of talk about going on it. I have a lot of respect for, you know, Dr. Jawahar at the QQA, Riyad Hamsa at the HEC, and of course the minister at the, edu you know, at the ministry. They're trying, they're looking, they're trying to figure out what this is going to mean. Um, but I don't think anyone has sorted that out yet. You know, I think I am an online learning junkie, but that's my career, that's my profession, that's what I do. I think whether or not that will take over, you know, how that will take over, what that will mean, what that will look like. You know, I think integrated learning um, simulations, I think a lot of that is showing up. We're certainly using more of it. Uh, we're certainly trying to pay much more attention to alternative learning methodologies and how that's going to build into the classroom. But like I said, it, it's not as simple as changing the classroom environment because that is only one component. The students are a much bigger component of that. And changing expectations, changing willingness to engage, you know, like willingness to engage with technology, no doubt about it. The, you know, the generations coming in are hugely connected. But what that means in a classroom specifically and how you measure those outcomes and what those are going to be is not anywhere fully, you know, fully executed. Yes, that's a learning curve. It is a learning curve on both sides. And it's, it's interesting that, to me at least, when you see it, um, there's a concept right now, flipped classroom is also another thing that's being very actively used and that relies heavily on um, technology in you know, pre-recorded lecture sessions, if you will, so that the classroom experience itself is a more interactive lab almost. You know, you're doing exercises, you're working through with, you know, and the upside in that is, talk about revolutionizing access to education. If that gets fully engaged, you could you know, the you know, Harvard professor could record the lectures and anyone in the world could use it as long as you have a qualified teacher or TA to do the lab kind of work in the classroom, which is a brilliant model philosophically and could truly revolutionize all of it if the students do the work before they get there. So again, and I think students are great and I think there's a lot of very motivated individuals, especially here in Bahrain, but has that been fully adopted in the classroom? It's difficult because if half the class doesn't show up prepared, you can't, it doesn't, it doesn't work because you, you spend the rest of it, you know, so it's really a paradigm, you know, technology is going to produce a paradigm shift in education, but it, has, it isn't there yet. I really enjoy the Capital Club. I mean, several of the people here know I've been a little bit of a delinquent member in that I haven't been as, my husband and I haven't been acti as actively involved, but I have found it to be very strategically useful and I've come to a number of the evening events, a number of the sesh, the seminars um, with the ministers, with other teaching experts and, you know, or other experts to talk about specific level of unique ideas, new content and every time we come I do see someone I need to talk to. I need, you know, I connect with someone who can be useful, you know, useful in something and I learn something from one of the speakers so it has been, even in my limited usage, a very, very valuable tool and something that I, we have consciously made an effort to try to, try to do more because it has been, uh, you know, it is where you come when you need to connect with the core of the market in Bahrain.